Okay. Hello and good morning. Happy Friday, everybody. We're back again for what I believe is what, week eight of the OTB 100? Week seven? Seven. Seven. It is seven. Getting ahead of ourselves. It's so good. It's worth both seven and eight that you're here. (laughs) So as always, if this is your first time here, we do encourage all kinds of participation, answer questions, ask questions, use the chat, whether you're on Zoom or on Facebook. And this will be available when we're all done as a recording, if you have to slip out early or if you showed up late, um, which you wouldn't really know right now because you're here on time. So the late people won't come for a bit more. But in any case, this will be available um, on our Level Up group on Facebook. And parts of it, if not all of it, will turn into the next episode of our podcast as well. So all kinds of ways you'll be able to listen over and over again, because (laughs) who, who doesn't have anything better to do with their weekend? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, but if this is your first time joining us, feel free to uh, pop in the chat anytime. If you guys have any questions as we go through things, we're happy to uh, answer anything you've got for us. So today we're talking about branding, branding, branding. So exciting. So nice. But, you said it thrice. That's right. Um, but honestly, you know, something that I think Daniel and I both uh, believe is that an agent's personal brand is extremely important, especially these days. And especially as we go into the future, I think your own personal brand is going to be far more important than the the brokerage's brand. Um, I think we've just entered into a different era of real estate where this is just such an important topic to discuss. So if you can really establish a strong brand for yourself, I think you're going to do really well and it's going to set you up for a lot of much more success into the future. Right on. Okay. We're jumping right in. So at this point, if you've been following along with the first several weeks of the OTB 100, we have already talked through the big picture stuff. We talked through your focus. We've talked through building your annual plan, your budget, um, and also starting to talk about the connections that you have and will make and how to manage them through a CRM system and lead management. Um, but this is this, this is the story that brings it all together for you. This is where you start really digging into who you are and what you represent to all the people you're going to connect with. And We open this up here with the first step, which is building your statements. And when we've talked about this before, this does seem like a relatively straightforward process, and it is, but this is not the kind of thing you do in 10 minutes. This is the kind of thing that takes a whole lot of, call it what you want to call it, soul searching if you want to be really deep, but really it's just really understanding what you represent right now and in the future. So you're probably familiar with the idea of mission statements and vision statements. Um, It's fair to say all large companies have them, but not a lot of entrepreneurs or even more specifically independent entrepreneurs like all of us take the time to build their own mission and vision statement. And this is really important to really develop your identity that will be the key building block to your brand. Um, So when we talk about a mission and a vision statement, The mission statement talks about what you do. This is what, it is your current goal, but it's also your current function and how you see yourself providing value or providing a service. It's what you do to your stakeholders. Um, And it's focused on today. Whereas a vision statement is not only future focused, but it's also deliberately lofty. It's a goal that you've got for where you see your business going and what you hope to achieve. And there's a whole bunch of examples here. You could definitely, you could go down the rabbit hole of looking into all kinds of examples of different companies, but these really lay out the difference between a mission and a vision statement really clearly. Tesla, which we all know, um, their mission statement is to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. That's their mission statement. It's what they're doing right now. That's their goal in their current function. But their vision is to create the most compelling car company of the 21st century by driving the world's transition to electric vehicles. That's a little bit of a bigger statement than just what they do. It's what what they're doing is hoping to achieve. And when you use words like most and best and biggest, 
that's when you start talking about your vision because you're focused on something that in theory is bigger than what you are right now. And if you already feel you're the best at something right now, then set a bigger goal because your forward looking goal needs to be lofty, needs to be something that you're focused on achieving. Um, I'll read just maybe we'll, we'll say Amazon is the other one, another big company, their mission. We strive to offer our customers the lowest possible prices, the best available selection at the utmost convenience. Yes, that's their goal. That's what they do right now in their eyes. That's their mission. But their vision is to be Earth's most customer-centric company where customers can find and discover anything they might want to buy online. So you've got not just most in there, but you've got the entire planet as the goal that the most is being tied to. So it is a very large statement. Arguably, Amazon is probably the closest, if not at the point where they're achieving that vision more than anybody else right now. But that keeps them moving forward and looking at new opportunities that help drive what they do on a day-to-day -day and help build their brand. Okay, so the next activity, uh, and something you guys can go into later, because obviously it's not something you can get off the top of your head, like Daniel mentioned, but creating your own mission and vision statement. This is something that obviously needs you to sit down and really give some thought to put your phone away, get rid of all the distractions. We've talked about this in the last several weeks when you're talking about your annual plan, like you need like, I, I mean, I would say for the mission and vision, you probably need a, a good couple of hours just to really think it through. And it might be separated into two hour time slots or whatever makes sense for your schedule. But this is such an important part because if you don't know, first of all, what, what it is that you currently do. And I mean, we're not just talking about generic real estate. You know, I, I help buyers and sellers find their next home or whatever it is. But you each have your own mission statement. You each have something that really sets you apart part from the rest of us. Um, so all of us provide some sort of a unique um, opportunity for clients to be working with us. And it's really important to figure out what that is. And I think it's helpful to go back to your, your annual plan. And what is it that you're focused on for the next year? Because I think that will help you to figure out where, like, what it is that you want to be doing and where it is that you want to go in the next year, in the next five, 10 years, whatever that might be for yourself. And be lofty with that vision. When you're lofty and you keep going back to that vision statement for yourself, it's amazing what actually comes true and how much more quickly it happens. So don't be afraid to just get out, go out there and, and put something on paper that's just like really aggressive. Like I want aggressive. That's 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 how we want to be working, you know? Yeah. So, and, and and like we when we did this process, this was months. Like this wasn't days or hours. This was months of really drilling home the right words and words really matter because this isn't the sort of thing we talk about your plan, your budget, things are going to evolve over time. Even your focus and your goals might evolve over time. You don't want to be adjusting your mission and your vision unless you're going through a seismic shift in your business and your focus. Um, and so, I mean, I, I, I mean, I can tell everybody like our mission as a brokerage, what we settled on, is boldly taking action to create the ultimate client experience and deliver results worth celebrating. And every word in that was very deliberate in how we put it together, where the bulk of our vision right now, our vision statement's a little bit longer, but the key part of our vision is to be the most forward-thinking real estate company today and always. So again, it's most, it's always, it's forward-thinking, and it's something that is, well, it has forward-thinking in it, but it's um, it's really something that identifies something that will drive us to keep going and also something that shapes the decisions we make as a company. Yeah, absolutely. And again, going back to just putting some time aside, this is such an important activity. And especially in real estate, we can get bogged down so quickly by client emails or requests for showings or whatever it might be an issue with closing. Um, set aside, like figure out what time of day or what day of the week you typically don't get as much bombarded by, by potential issues or by potential requests and just turn off and do this. It will be, you'll feel as though you've accomplished so much after it. It can seem like, oh, whatever mission and vision. Let's just move on from that. It doesn't really matter. This is like so paramount, not only right now for your business, but in the future. So I just, I can't, 
stress how important it is to just give yourself the time to work on this. But hey, it's up to and, you. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, Cindy, yeah, I think I made a mistake and just um, somebody asked about the two last pages of this PDF are blank. Um, yeah, that that was just, uh, it, they're meant, well, not meant to be blank, but there's not supposed to be words there. So <laughs> it's there. Notes, extra notes for you, pages that's, of notes, I guess. That's right. Anytime you see a blank page, just fill it with your ideas and, and do a brain dump. Use it as yeah. an excuse to do a brain dump and write stuff that's down. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Oh, right. jump in. Go for it. I'm already muted. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> that's, that's how it works. So, okay. We're going to talk about the difference here between marketing and branding. And basically marketing is what you're doing to get people to buy things. It's the stuff you put out there that will convince people to work with you. But branding is how you actually get that done through getting people to believe what you're saying. Okay. There's a difference between effective marketing and ineffective marketing. And often the reason for that difference is the branding and whether or not you've got a consistency and a relevancy to the story you're telling alongside the marketing. And we've all experienced that by seeing ads that don't resonate with us or that seem really vanilla because they don't represent what we're actually trying to hear, or maybe in some ways the brand doesn't resonate with us, which is fine. Because in some cases, your brand is meant to attract the people with whom you are going to resonate with and work well with. Um, and it says here, so this is a lot of the, the, uh, the discussion that we're going to go through today is going to focus on these points that we're going to talk about in more detail. What is separating you from other agents in your market? Okay, it's all about differentiation. And we talk about this in other sessions as well. But especially if you're in Ontario, if you're in Canada, and you're watching this, you are in a very deep sea of lots of people who do the same thing and are competing for the same eyeballs and ears. However, there are the things beyond the core service you provide that make you different that make you unique and that create a story for yourself. And that's what you need to start to identify. Because to be successful and to create a brand, you need to understand where you differentiate from everybody else. Um, and then we talk about your brand being a story and your clients are the actors in that story. So whatever it is you're putting out there, that is the story you're telling people about what you represent and who you are. The reason you're doing that in the same way as with, if you take someone on a showing and you want them to start picturing, you know, their furniture in the house and you want them to start kind of identifying with how this particular property is going to work or not work for them. It's the same way you want people to look at you in whether or not you're going to work with them and how you're going to make sense to them as part of your story. Um, and that ties into the types of people you're going after. We've talked about when we talk about focus, your goal cannot be being everything to everybody. And your brand is going to help reinforce that fact that you're trying to speak to a specific subset of people with whom you want to focus on. And that's what your story is going to represent. And then finally here, demonstrating your knowledge in a way that doesn't end up in a sales pitch. In a sales pitch. Um, the idea here is that you want to be able to show people value and you want to show people that you're working for them before you're working for them. Because a big part of brand is developing trust and you can't do that by just talking at people and being the used car salesman, no disrespect to used car salesman, but as an example, you don't want to be that person who's always just saying, bye, 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 I'm great, come to me, look at me, this is why I'm a fantastic, show people as part of your brand story why you're fantastic and give them a reason to not just feel they need to call you to get something, but to actually proactively give them things that build their trust and develop your story. This is the perfect time to introduce the marble, the, the marble story, the marble jar. Oh. Remember I was talking to you about this? Yeah, yeah. Talk to me. Talk to me <laughs> about your marbles. All right. So I was listening to a Brene Brown uh, podcast, and I don't know if anybody knows she's a great author. She um, has written Dare to Lead, um, one of my favorite books. 
And uh, she was talking about the idea of trust and she equated it to a marble jar. And every time you, it, it's a slow build when you're building trust with somebody. And it's, it's basically like putting a marble in a jar every time you do something that builds that trust. So if you're following up with somebody after um, like, you know, that they had surgery, one of your past clients had surgery and you want to follow up and you just send them a quick message and see how they're doing or give them a call and see how they're doing. That's one marble in the jar. Um, and when you lose trust with people, it's it, the same thing as basically taking a handful of marbles out of the jar. And that just has so much more of an impact, but it just really got me thinking about how important it is to be continually present with your clients and continually those building blocks of trust are so important. Um, so it, and then it goes back to our CRM discussion about how keeping in touch with your clients is just slowly building that trust over time. Um, so anyway, I just thought it was such a great, it had such great practical use for um, real estate and what we do today. So moving on. Okay. So the next exercise that we want to do is creating your main character. And this will just give you so much clarity in terms of how you're going to put yourself out there and what kind of marketing and advertising you're going to be doing to attract your main characters. So we really want to get specific on this. And again, it's important to recognize that even though you might have a specific main character, that doesn't stop you from working with other people that might reach out to you or get referred to you or however it is that you get get your leads. But having a main character will allow you to just build that focus into your brand. So what your client requires and, and, and their needs is a really important part of this. Um, but first of all, just have some fun with it. Ask what, what is their age? Where do they live? Um, what type of home do they have? It can be very different depending on who you're trying to attract. Um, how much do they make? What kind of job do they have? What are their cultures and values and traditions? You can go on and on and on. These are just some of the questions that you could ask, but really get a good idea of that person so that you, you know who it is that you're talking to. It makes it so easy so that you're crafting appropriate messages that really resonate with that type of person. If that makes sense. I'm, am I freezing a lot? I feel like I am. You're a little bubbly. You're a little bubbly. I'm got a little that, bubbly. It's got that gurgle going on, but I don't know if you saw Richard's asking what your main character is. So, Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, my main character is uh, a single prof young professional woman um, prob in her 30s to 40s. And uh, she has either looking to get into her first home or move up to that second home um, to a slightly larger home, um, either a condo or a townhouse. That is my ideal main character. What about you, Daniel? Uh, my, my main character is very much that transitional younger person, a little bit younger than me, usually young couples who maybe have had their first or second kid who are also in the, um, uh, that upsizing stage. But for me, it's a lot more about their personalities. I like people who are, it's a weird thing to say, but I like people who are nervous about real estate um, and people who like to be told things straight, but in a way that can be controlled in with some humor and with some relaxation techniques. But the idea for me is talking to people who are getting into something for the first time and are very unsure um, cause it's all about reassurance, but also being real with people and not, uh, not sugarcoating things. All right. Oh, Relaxation that's... techniques. I was like, it's kind of weird. Well, no, like I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> massaging, I'm, not I'm not massaging their temples or anything like that, yeah. but, but no, but, a for, massage therapist too on but the for side. me, for me, it's all about because the way that I approach my clients is often going through expectation management right from the get-go before they even know what their expectations are. It's about giving them a bad scene and working them up to the good scene rather than the other way around. I like to start them off not fearing the worst, but acknowledging their fears 
and talking them through why it won't be that bad. But at the same time, not trying to pretend that buying a house is easy in this market. Yeah, don't worry. We'll just go in. You give the price you want with lots of conditions and there's no problem. It's all about yeah. really making sure people understand things so that when things get real, they know what's coming. And I find that that works and resonates the best with people who haven't done it as often as others. Yeah. Well, Richard just said you should be a psychiatrist, which I think is the role you take on a lot of times with your clients, it's, whether you want to it, or is not. It the glasses? Do I- <laughs> Do I look more? Maybe the glasses help me look more. more No, but I think that expectation piece is really important because it's something that we often overlook. And especially when we're working with buyers in this market, it's so important to really set out what those expectations are. Because if somebody gets into a bidding war and they just don't even understand what is happening or why things are going the way they are, uh, it can be really deflating for people in that moment. So setting those building blocks up ahead of time in terms of expectations is really key. Absolutely. It's, there's a fine line between being bossy and taking charge. And I need to take charge with, and we were just talking about this in, in another context. Like I need to know on a personal level what's next and what's happening next. But part of that is making sure my clients are on the same page as me with it and understand that. Um, And I welcome the same way we do here. I welcome as many questions and I encourage the questions because I don't want surprises for them because I don't want surprises for me. And there's a certain type of client who appreciates that. Um, And it's, it's not everybody. Like I don't work well with know-it-alls, right? Like the the people who know exactly what they want in some case, they might be easier to deal with because they just tell you what to do. But that's not my niche. That's not where I add the most value to them. And like we said, Mm -hmm. that doesn't mean I'll say no. If somebody says, Hey, I just saw this thing on realtor.ca for 1.5 million. Can you do an offer for me? I don't say, well, sorry. Like if you don't have any questions, then I can't help you. (laughs) Right. But But that's your main character. Yeah. But that's, that's my main character. Mm -hmm. Um, So from that, we're actually going to take these attributes and we're going to build a person. This is literally writing a story where we want you to give them a name, right? Um, my, mine might be, uh, I think mine's going to be a couple. We're going to call my couple uh, Adam and uh, let's say Karen, because Karen gets a bad rap out there. And I, like, I like Karen. <laughs> I like the name Karen. It doesn't deserve the flack that it gets. So Adam and Karen are, sure. my, are my ideal client. And their profile is a young couple. Uh, Adam's 31. Karen just turned 30. They've got a one-year-old at home and they're thinking about expanding their family. However, they're already feeling cramped in the condo that they've owned for three years. Um, They're aware of what they see in the media that's really scary and that makes it seem like even selling their place might make it impossible to buy the home that they need, but they need help with that. uh, Adam's got a good job. Karen just went back to work, but now they're paying for daycare. And they might be confronted with maternity leave, um, which might give another hit to income. Um, So they're just trying to stick handle both the financial element and the nervousness about the next step in their life. But at the same time, they want to be really excited about growing their family and not stressed out about the good thing that is buying a bigger home. That is Adam and Karen, my ideal client. Call me. Nice. (laughs) <laughs> come on Adam and Karen <laughs> um yeah and then the interview part is important too. I, 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 I didn't know if you were going to give me your, your your client's name but I can move forward oh, oh okay my client's name is Kira and Kira is actually a past client of mine and she <laughs> you're using a real client <laughs> no because she's referred so much business to me of the same nature so she's she's my girl Kira that's fair that's yeah. fair okay fair Um, and then what you're going to need to do, whether or not this is a real client that you've had, um, you need to find the people in your life and people that, you know, who fit this profile the best and interview them as if they were your client, the people, you know, and trust often are going to, in one way or another, mirror the people you want to be working with. Right. So the ones who are in your life generally are the types of people who you resonate with best and probably in some way, shape or form will match the type of person you've set as your ideal client. If not, you need to go seek out these people because without understanding what you think you know 
about what they're looking for and what they feel about you and what they are as people, it's impossible for you to write an effective brand story about yourself in such a way that's going to attract them and resonate with them. So take them out, talk to them about their lives, talk to them about what they're looking for, their opinions of the market, whatever it is, specific to real estate or not, but definitely things like when they're looking for help to buy a home, or if they were, what would be the things that are most important to them? Because different types of people are interested in different types of things. It's not always about marketing or the look of things or knowledge or cost. It could be any combination of those things. Um, I know when we've done it in the past, one of the big things people have said is, I want the people my friends are telling me is the best, right? Like sometimes it's who do I trust based on what I'm seeing out there from people like me. Um, but you won't know unless you ask. And it's not as helpful, obviously, if you do it one time versus doing it three times with three different people. So you can actually have some data, find the patterns so that you can create a brand and adjust your brand to really fit what it is that people in your ideal client set are saying. Exactly. And I think one thing that we do a lot is that um, we assume that people know what we know, or we assume that people see things the same way we do because we're in real estate all the time. But we have to keep in mind that our potential clients or our ideal client isn't is only entering real estate when they want to make a transaction. So they're not as much in the know. They're not as much paying attention to what everybody else is doing. So really having that insight from the outside is really, really important. It will be really helpful for you to hone in on that, that brand for yourself. Okay. Sorry. I was just reading Richard's comment. Market research is awesome. It really breaks down our preconceived notions about what we think clients need or want. Yeah, exactly. So same, same kind of idea. Like we think we know what our clients want and most of the time we're wrong. <laughs> so, I mean, I think we start as we, we continue to to grow in this business, um, we start to get a handle on that a little bit more. But when you're first starting out, it can be really hard to figure that out. So having those interviews is, is really important. Absolutely. Just, just think about the ads you see out there and how many of them are just talking at people. And yeah. those are the ones that are usually the generic ads, right? The ones that just say the buzzword stuff and they talk as if there is one way to do things and that's the only way and this is the best way and that's fine. However, think about how much that resonates with different types of people. And if that's not what's important to them or if there's all this noise surrounding the core message that might speak to someone, it's harder to get across the right message to someone when it's surrounded by 15 other messages, right? And this mm -hmm. is again that that sleazy salesman approach. And again, no disrespect if that is what you do in your marketing, because if you are mass marketing to tens of thousands of people, you can't have necessarily one message that's going to speak to all of them. But if your focus is on a certain type of client, you're going to miss out on them by saying too many things, right? Mm -hmm. If somebody says, I'd like to buy a red watch, and you have 10 different red, or you have one red watch, and they say, not that one. You say, don't worry, I have this one. Don't worry, I have this one. I have this one. Okay, you want digital? I have this one. It doesn't make you look like a specialist anymore. It just makes you look like someone who's saying whatever they need to say to get the sale. And that usually won't get you the, get you the deal versus somebody who's saying exactly what is in the wheelhouse of the person you're trying to talk to. Yeah, exactly. Um, so from from the last page what we're going to do is create a unique selling proposition for yourself or you know an elevator pitch why somebody should be working for with you um, so define your target audience from the past uh, exercise that we just did and then what is the problem that you can solve for them so use the evidence that you got from the research you've done from the conversations you've had with the ideal clients and figure out what it is that you're going to solve for them. If you're targeting first-time home buyers, it's probably surrounding ed the education piece and helping them through that first time, that whole process, because that can be very overwhelming. Um, when you're, you know, for myself dealing with young professional women, like they're 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 very, you know, they know what they want. Um, so it, it's really about 
uncovering those opportunities for them, providing them with the data that makes sense to, to, to show them why it is that they, they should make this next step into this, this particular um, condo versus another one. Um, and, and then just being there as a support to answer any questions that might come up along the way. Like I'm, I'm very involved with, with my ideal client and I love doing it because they're the type of people that I really like working with. Yeah. And so then we talk about the one of a kind benefits that you can provide. And you want to come up with the specific things that you are going to provide to your ideal client. Okay. This isn't necessarily a bullet point list of I do photography, I do staging, I do this, I do that. It might be, but really dig in again to the people you're trying to talk to. So in my case, I mean, one of the three or four benefits I provide is uh, if we're talking tangi tangibly, I'll provide things like an actual guide that we're going to talk about later, like something that gets ahead of questions. It kind of starts the conversation with here's a lot of information that will start to answer questions before you ask them. But then I'm also like we talked about before, I'm a therapist and I'm a therapist before I'm a realtor with a lot of my clients. And that's because the approach I take with my clients is almost, and I talk about this all the time, but it's canceling out the stuff they expect out of a realtor, right? There's all the stuff that everybody advertises. And if you can start right out of the gate and saying, listen, you're getting all that. Don't worry about quality photography and staging and, and home inspections and whatever. Worry about the stuff that you're not seeing in everybody else's ads. That's what you're trying to think about here. When it says one of a kind, that's very deliberate in that it's one of a kind, right? There might be other people who do it, but for you, where are you separating yourself from the pack? They could be very specific things or they could be higher level things, but they've got to be benefits that come from you. And then based on those benefits, what is the promise that you can offer to your ideal client? This is almost like a mini mission statement for your clients where you're saying, because I'm who I am and you're working with me, this is what I guarantee you, you will get out of these, out of the, um, experience you have with me, right? And it doesn't, again, it's not a vision statement. This isn't going to necessarily be, I will be the most wonderful person you've ever met in your entire life and will ever meet for the rest of your life. But you might want to promise somebody that they will have uh, a pain-free or a stress-free experience where they can be confident that they have received the best advice that keeps them comfortable during the sales process or whatever it is, something like that. It might be tied to the price, which a lot of people want to focus on. Um, but the promise is a little bit different. I might've said the word guarantee there. And there's a bit of a difference between a promise and a guarantee, right? In our business, we can't guarantee things. So be careful about saying things that guarantee tangible deliverables versus promising things like you will receive from me, you know, the best X I have to offer, make it more related to things like your fiduciary duty and the things that you know, you can guarantee people that are within your control versus the things that you want to promise and guarantee that are out of your control. You can't guarantee somebody they will buy a, buy a house for under a certain amount of money with a certain set of specs. You can't, you can promise that you will do your best and you will be the best person for them to find something within their means that achieves the most things off their checklist that they want to achieve, right? Um, and then from that, you're going to take your benefits, you're going to take your promise and you're going to bring that all together. And that creates, you know, the one paragraph statement of why people should be working with you, why your ideal client should be working with you. So a lot of this sounds really similar when we're talking about your unique proposition, your unique benefits, your promise, but it's sort of deliberately separate in that you're going to be coming up with things that tie together, but are a little bit different. And then you're going to bring it all together at the end, which really becomes your story of why you are the person for your ideal client. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of times when you're being asked by people, especially when you go into a listing presentation, I've been asked this a few, several times, it's like, why should we work with you? What's different about you? And there's been times before going through this exercise where I'm stumbling over my words, trying to figure out a key differentiator that's going to hit home for them. 
Um, and, and so when you have this already work already done and really understand what it is, what, what the, what the value is that you provide, it's going to be much easier for you to communicate that. Now, it's important to know that you might not resonate with every single seller out there, but the people that you do resonate, you'll get the business a lot easier. Exactly. And, and Richard brings up another good example of when he did market research uh, and he was looking into things like decluttering services and things like um, packing assistance. Not everybody needs that, but if your wheelhouse and your ideal client is someone who's a downsizer or an estate sale, that is an area where that is something that's looked for. And we've run into that as well. When we've had situations where somebody was selling off a place, their mother moved into a home and they were really stressed out, you identify the unique stresses of that market where things like decluttering, things like throwing stuff out, disposing of stuff for them is a huge benefit. And that might be something if that's where your focus is that you're looking at, but that wouldn't be a focus if you're dealing with millennials buying their first home. Totally different benefit mm -hmm. that doesn't speak to those people. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. After that, we're going to brand your business, which is the exciting part. So mm -hmm. you want to name your brand and create your hook. And I think it's important to note that naming your brand like you see a lot of people out there that will name their brand their own name, which I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think it's good to have that name recognition. And so if you don't want to like go too much into something super creative that might not necessarily connect back to you, it might be Katie Steinfeld real estate or something along those lines, um, because that is you're connecting back to your own yourself, your, per, your personality. So gives the, give that some thought. I think that there's no right or wrong with this. Um, so we don't want to direct you in a certain way if it doesn't connect back to your ultimate goals and, and what makes sense for you. And then why somebody should work for you is kind of like your tagline. So, you know, we have an agent in our brokerage that has your friend in real estate. And I think that's a really great tagline because it really speaks to how he approaches his business, how he works with clients. He really, really takes a hands-on approach guiding people through the process so that your friend in real estate really, really makes sense. Um, so something along those lines. And again, it doesn't have to be something you have to be outward about, it, it just kind of summarizes exactly what your brand stands for. And that can just be for yourself, or it could be something that you use in your marketing and your branding. Your brand colors. And a lot of times when people think about branding their business, that's the first thing they think about is their colors, their logo, the fun stuff, let's design something. But if you don't go through some work and some thoughts through what you're, you want your brand to represent and who you want to be attracting, your brand color and logo are going to be changing every single year. And we see that a lot of times with people that, you know, oh, like first they were pink and green and now they're black and gold. And it can be very confusing and it could really impact the efforts you've put forward in the past if you're constantly changing the look and feel of what your brand represents. So make sure that you do the work beforehand before you get into the fun stuff. This is kind of like the reward of doing the work beforehand because this is fun, but it has to really connect back to what you're trying to say to people. And, and, um, and, we've, and we've been down these roads. So like we're saying this from experience of redoing logos and redoing colors. Um, and it's not fun to do that. Like it's fun when you first make it and you're like, this looks good. But looking back now at the first time we made a logo and a color set for on the block, I, I mean, it just, it felt fun and we did it because it was fun. And some of it still has transitioned to today, but we weren't thinking this way back then. We were thinking we want something that looks cool and that's yeah. great but you can achieve both if you take the time the same way you should on your mission and your vision and all the other steps here. It's worth the extra time to challenge yourself, to talk to people who maybe are your ideal client also and say, what do you think about this? Um, because it really, it needs to make you happy, but it's not about you either, right? This isn't about you attracting yourself, right? This is about you attracting your ideal client and you need to make sure that it resonates with them and it ties to your story in a way that makes sense to people. Mm -hmm. 
Exactly. Yeah. We've got 5,000 folders in a back room in our office that we never really have used for anymore because the colors are off. We still use them, but every time I, I, I use one, I'm like, oh, <laughs> yeah, it's um, embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, we're, we're telling you guys this from experience. So we know what it what like what happens when you don't do the work beforehand. Um, so, and then, and then, get working. Like, you know, you go on Facebook and like start making a cohesive look for yourself online and through your marketing materials. Um, it just makes life a lot easier. If you've got standard templates in, you know, Canva, for example, if, if you guys don't use Canva, C-A-N-V-A, that's where you can create a lot of, um, like you can create a logo, you can create all your social media posts, um, it's a great thing and you can have your brand colors and your logo uploaded in there so that you uh, can just basically like fill it in as you go. So you have a new listing that comes out and you want to put an Instagram post out there. You have a set template with the fonts and the colors. It's just about slip putting in that picture. Um, it, it's just so much easier because you can really spend a lot of time on the design part of, of our jobs when it comes to the marketing and advertising piece. So if you've got that work done ahead of time with the templates, um, not only is it easier for you, but again, it goes back to that brand recognition that people see. So when they're on Instagram and they see, oh, you've got a new listing or you know something new has come out for you, they instantly recognize it because they know your colors, they know your fonts. Um, same thing when it comes to postcards. If you're sending out postcards to an, um, your neighborhood, um, we don't do this, but we do know a couple of agents in our area that are really good at it because every single postcard, it ha- might have a slightly different message, but the look and feel is exactly the same every single time. And that's why that person does really well because people know that if once they're thinking of buying or selling, if they don't know anybody else, they're probably going to call the, this person because they're always in their mailbox consistently. <laughs> mm-hmm. So yeah, just some ideas there. Yeah. There's a lot of Canva love in the chat room, which oh, okay. <laughs> goes without saying, but yeah, it's, yeah. it's a great tool. And it, I mean, I, I know Simone said you got Canva pro and we've switched to that too, where there's a bit more flexibility and, and the ability to use all the imagery and save your brand yeah. a little bit better. Um, exactly. So those of you who don't want to invest in it, Canva is still great as a free tool as well. Like we started mm-hmm. by using it free. Some of our agents still use the free tool. So uh, definitely highly recommended. And the goal there, like Katie's saying, is consistency. And it's being able to create something. I, I mean, I don't have the statistic, but just imagine seeing pieces from the same agent that look different in different places. It is so much harder to understand and resonate with somebody and recognize them when things look different every time you see them, right? But when somebody looks the same and all of a sudden you see the colors or you see a certain font and you're like, oh, that's Katie. Think about how much value that is to just preserving your brand and building your brand story with people, right? That's why big brands are recognizable. If we were to show you brands The kids watch this on, they watch this test on YouTube where it was showing like pieces of logos and you had to name the logo and they, and they could name every single one. Right. Mm. So that's what you're going for. Like people aren't going to see a picture of a house in a certain color and say, oh, wow, that's John Smith. Of course it is. But they're way more likely to start to recognize who you are when there's consistency and your marketing approach with people, which we're also going to talk about in future sessions is also consistent with all the pieces looking the same. People will just really start to feel what you're telling them a little bit easier. Yeah. Um, And sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say one more thing is if you're not into the design part of things and a lot of people, that's not their forte, you can find people that will help build kind of like a, a branding package for you and just put it all together. You can go on Fiverr, um, which is another option um, that gets you like a, like a logo or, or even like a branding kit. And it's pretty inexpensive. Um, or if you want to work with like a local company in your area that can put it all together for you, it's not something don't spend too much time stressing about this. If you want to, again, like we always talk, leave it to the professionals. This might be an opportunity to do that and just um, get something that really suits you, but is, has been done professionally. Absolutely. And there's nothing wrong with having a logo that's got that, you know, the three houses or whatever. And I mean, ultimately, do I have something like our logo? 
started that way. Like that's our logo. And that remains our logo. It's got that base to it, which I think a lot of people you see a lot of with like the little house outline thing. We, we went a little bit further because it's got the gavel there and it ties into the fact that we also do auctions and that really brought it together for us and kept it simple enough. Simple is very, uh, I, to me, it's preferable. It's not necessary, but the simpler a logo is, consider all the different places you're going to be using a logo, right? It's not just going to be necessarily on your website or your business card. You might use it in social ads. It might be something that ends up on, on newsletters, on letterheads. Um, it might be big. It might be small. It might be color. It might be black and white. You have to consider all of these things when you're building out a logo um, or permutations of a logo that can be consistent. Um, so these are all things to consider. And again, it's the sort of stuff you want to address early rather than building a complex logo that looks good only to realize it can only be used in a few different types of media. And so the advantages of a strong brand presence, number one, online tar targeting capabilities. And when we talk about online marketing, and if you are going to be going down the road of digital marketing in any way, the way it works from a cost perspective is you're paying for basically the impressions you get. And just think realistically about the value you'll get if you're focused on a particular subset and particular target market versus everybody. Right. If you're getting 10,000 impressions from a collection of people where maybe five or 10 percent of them are actually who you're trying to reach versus 4,000 impressions where half of them are the people you're trying to reach, you're going to be spending less money to reach a bigger subset of the people you want because your brand is focused and your understanding of who you're going after is focused. Also, from a simplicity perspective, like we just talked about with Canva, when you know your brand story, when you know your target audience, you know your colors, you know your logo, it makes all the decision making less about the what do I do now and more about the here's what I'm doing. I know how to fit this into my story or it doesn't fit my story and maybe this isn't what I should be doing. It just allows you to take one piece out of your advertising process where you're not reinventing the wheel every time, but rather just taking a template and taking something you know that people know and adjusting the message slightly to reflect what it is you're trying to say. Um, also, from a differentiation perspective, it says here, camouflage doesn't get you hired. Think about that, okay? Blending in as somebody who does what everybody else does is not a good thing, okay? Again, we're going to assume that all of you are good at what you do, okay? You're going to get the job done for people, but they need to be able to see you out of the mix of other people in order to make the decision to go with you. And without differentiating yourself, it is very hard to be the one that people are going to pick because why would they choose you just because you're telling them you're good? Everyone else is telling them you're good or sorry, everyone else is telling them that they're good. It's the same way. Um, I think I've talked about this before. When I worked at the football team, we'd have a hundred resumes for one job. And we'd throw out 80 of them because they all said the same thing. They all said good things, but you need a way to choose that needle in the haystack, right? If you just wanted to choose the first person who comes up on your Google search, that's probably not the people you're going after if you're developing a strong brand for yourself. Um, and also, this is all part of a process to allow you to constantly learn, become more comfortable with, and understand your target market so that your story can evolve with their story. Okay, because your brand won't change, but it will evolve over time because the people you work with and the way that you operate will evolve with your business as well. So it doesn't mean you're going to stop focusing necessarily on that target market you identified in the beginning, but understand that that group of people will remain your clients long term. That's the goal. And the people they refer you to are the people who are like them and also the people who are like the way they were when you first met them. So continue to stay in tune with what's important to your story, the types of people you're after. And the more you're able to stay focused on that and keep learning, the stronger your network and your sphere will become, which just keeps the business coming to you. Right. And here's your blank pages. Write down your notes. Draw out a logo. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot there were blank pages after that. Yeah. But yeah. So that's, that is your branding session. Um, we can take any questions that anybody might have at this point. 
And again, this, this whole package is available in the chat right now. It'll also be available for download through our, I believe our level up group. Yes, I think. Is that where we put it? Uh, yeah, exactly. I'm just going to put it in again, um, because I think if people come in later and they don't see the beginning of the chat, um, you might not get uh, it. So here it is again for anybody that might have missed it. I uh, thought you were just going to say snooze, you lose, but I guess not. No. Snooze, you win. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions on this or any other topics we've covered so far? Richard's asking, are you going to go through how to speak, create content for the ideal client to attract them? Uh, we are going to be talking about content. Uh, there's a whole session dedicated to content. Um, specifically on the speaking, we are, when we talk about buyer presentation, listing presentation, we will go through some of the, I guess, nuanced approaches you can take and how you communicate in those respects. Um, mm -hmm. In this OTB 100, from an actual scripting cold call perspective i don't know if we've got that in any of our sessions but but it's something that we could consider because we have been altering a little bit the the sessions as we go um so if there is anything anybody would like to see um i could bring up quickly just what we're going to be um going through next but from a content perspective like we're definitely um going to be talking about content creation so we can build that in yeah, consistent content. So next week's listing presentation, then your buyer package, and then consistent content. So that could be something that we look to add in that session there. And, and again, I mean, beating a dead horse, but this is in a deliberate order, right? When we start talking about buyer presentation, listing presentation, and content, those are built on the back of your brand, right? Mm -hmm. you, you don't want to establish your brand for obvious reasons after you've started to create the content. Because mm -hmm. yeah content won't really be on brand. How many of you guys feel comfortable with your brand right now? Do you feel like you have got a good handle on your brand? Or is it something that's evolving right now? Just curious. Uh, hi there, Salima. <clears throat> hi. Uh, yeah, that, hi, how are you? Good, thanks. Uh, great session, thank you. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm definitely working on the, I think the content is not like, I have the vision, I know who is my ideal client and who I need to target. But I think what I put out there needs work. Like, it's not something that if people read it, they will recognize it and they will point out who I am, right? Or what they right. can get from me. I think that's something I'm definitely working on still. Um, yeah, I mean, it, more ideas on that or uh, just uh, I'm not a marketing person so I think that's something that I maybe need to talk to somebody and then they can just point out some things to me but I know what I need to target like who's the people that I need to target in what yeah. value I bring but I don't think mm. it's in my content like I don't think it's easily recognizable in my content so got it yes that's so do you find that do you find it's more the the consistency of, of what you're putting out there or just the look in general that you're having a hard time with? Uh, not so much the logo or anything like that and all that look of that, but just, I think it's just the content, like information that comes out. Like at times I put up something on maybe on social media and I, and I think about it, I'm like, well, that's, that's what everybody else does too, right? So what, what are you different at? But this is what I'm different at. And I've heard it, many people say that to me this is where your value is. Like they really do value when that comes out. And um, and I've, I've even heard other agents tell me that, like you really do have that value. So I have some uh, construction, I have a construction business, a renovation business. So that kind of, no matter how much you don't say it, and, and in this, uh, especially in this market, I think that's really, it, it is a value. If you kind of know your stuff, uh, you know, and, and you need that in certain situations. Um, so it does come out, obviously, and it, it does help the client, whether they're buyer or seller. Uh, but I don't think that comes out enough in my marketing in general. Mm -hmm. I mean, I yeah. think there's, there's a lot of different, there's a lot of angles you could take. Um, 
and I'm not sure which, which approach you've taken so far, but if there's like, that's part of your story and definitely part of your unique uh, benefit that you're able to offer people. So allowing that to resonate either through maybe there's testimonials or case studies or things that can become more apparent to people of successes you've had and how they've resonated with people puts a little bit more of a story to what you do. Um, people definitely uh, will react more to real examples than to don't worry, I can do this kind of stuff, right? Because if you have done it and you're saying people tell you what your value proposition is, that might be part of how you put it out there. But it also is reflected, like we talked about in a different session, where is your comfort level and what type of a realtor are you? You said, you know, you're not necessarily one type of realtor who's going to be overtly out there and, and, you know, screaming from the tops of mountains, look at me, look at me, look at me, right? So that's okay. Um, but that might reflect itself in also not just what your brand message is, but also how you're delivering it with what medium. Um, and so, I mean, it's a, it's a bigger discussion than that. And it's going to take a lot of reflection on where you're comfortable and what might, uh, what might resonate best with the people you're trying to reach, but you definitely have, everyone has unique value propositions, but you've already identified one that is definitely unique to you in a way that should serve you well. But it's to your point, it's about getting it out there and making sure people understand this is a value you might not get from everybody else. Agreed. Thank you. Yeah. And our session on the content, like creating the content, um, will hopefully be helpful um, to kind of push that thought process forward and just figuring out what it is and how you can post it. We, we're, we'll talk about a, um, a little bit about also repurposing your content. And that's something I think a lot of us often overlook. If we do a YouTube video um, on neighborhood highlights or maybe a first time home buyers video and it's a, a longer video, chopping that video up into smaller pieces to put it on Instagram or Facebook is a great way to be more efficient with the content that you're putting out there. I also think that a lot of people get hooked up on having to post daily or every couple of days. And you don't have to do that. I know a lot of agents that don't even post on Instagram, the, the posts, but they put up a lot of Instagram stories. If anybody knows Nasma Ali, all of her posts are on, on, on stories and everybody follows them because they're really, really um, like it shows that she knows what she's talking about. It really speaks to her brand. And it gets her a lot of attention. She's working with NBA, you know, athletes now, like, you know, people from the Raptors that need houses. So like, you know, she's built that up over time. It's not like all of a sudden thousands of people are watching her stories daily, but it's something she's more comfortable with. It speaks to how she communicates and it goes after the people that she's trying to attract. So it's all in one, but it's really an evolution. And I think it's something that when people first get onto some of these platforms, they think, okay, well, now how am I going to get a thousand people watching me daily? It's, it's going to take time to build that up. But if it's something you enjoy doing and something that really speaks to the audience you're looking to attract, you'll slowly get there. So it's just, it's, it's a much slower process sometimes than we want it to be. Well, and, and definitely the goal, you can't be looking like we talk about the big goal and the step-by-step -step to get there. It's not about having a thousand people watching you all the time if they're a thousand of the wrong person, right? Yeah. Because you yeah. can get you can get followers, you can buy followers. I'm sure everybody knows like you could do all that, but it's completely counterproductive to what you're trying to achieve. I would much rather have a hundred followers who are engaged in my wheelhouse, the kinds of people who I know would use me and call me the moment they've got a real estate need and refer me to everybody else that fits that bill as well versus 10,000 who could care less, right? So when we talk about what to post, I mean, I, I've changed my approach to it now where I just want people to know who I am. It's, it's about real estate here and there, but it's almost like the real estate is getting sprinkled into the, hey, just get to know me because this is gonna be the person that you get to know if we do work together, right? Um, but that might not be you. It might be more about delivering value you know, on some sort of a consistent basis, maybe, you know, you do a weekly report or whatever it is, but there's, there's not a science to it other than identifying the message you're trying to get out there and not force feeding things because you feel you need to, because that mm -hmm. it doesn't work. Like people know. 
And, you know, the algorithms out there are smart enough to know when you've done things that are just out of character or won't connect with anybody. Yeah. Yeah. So Simone commented, I struggle with social media, but I've excelled in person. I definitely want to have a brand message and develop connections on social media to connect the two. Um, and that's, yeah, that's something that I think a lot of people like feel the pressure to put themselves out there on social media. And if it's something you want to do, I think, you know, my suggestion is just to start small, like maybe put one video out or do one story a week and just get more comfortable seeing yourself on video. Cause I think a lot of it, when it comes down to personal branding is, as you said, Daniel, like people seeing you for who you are might not necessarily be a real estate message every single time, but at least they know your personality, how you talk, your opinions, all of that really matters when people want to start working with, with a professional. And, and none, and none of this is like the gospel. Like you don't no, no. don't, don't take this as a, if you're not going to be real with people, don't go on social <laughs> media because there's lots of us who are rightfully and properly private people and they don't want mm -hmm. the world to know their yeah. personal life. Right. And that's totally cool. That's probably more rather than less. So don't feel the need to put pictures of your dog and your kids up because no. people need to get, you know, get to know you better. Um, yeah. But identify who it is you're trying to reach, what you're comfortable saying, and then just be consistent with it. Yeah. And um, Renata talks about, you know, how to promote herself. You know, she's gotten to the point where she's, you know, really comfortable in that realtor career, which is excellent. Um, and how, how is it that you promote yourself? And I think it goes back to really just picking and choosing your messages and bringing value and in there, you know, you, you don't have to have an outward message all the time, but just really, um, again, going back to speaking to who your target audience is, bringing them value. And that's when you're going to start conversations. That's when you're, if you're on, at least if you're on social media, you're going to get those messages saying, oh, I really liked what you said there. You know, can I ask you a question or, you know, can you give me some more information? And that's when the conversation starts. And so it's not necessarily like an outward promotion of yourself, like, you know, putting a picture of yourself up and saying, Hey, I'm in real estate, call me. Um, Cause I, I think that that's slowly just starting to become less and less effective with people. It's, it's, it's it, in my mind, it's more of an old school tactic that is just not really going to resonate with most people. People aren't going to see a picture of an agent and say, Oh, I should call them because I want to sell my house. Um, again, it goes back to that marble jar and putting in those marbles every time you give somebody a piece of value or a post that really resonated with them. That's that, that those are the actions that you'll take to, to really get people to pay attention and to reach out to you. I'll read the, I'll read the latest comment here and then we'll keep talking. <laughs> Just in. <laughs> uh, we all do what we do and don't realize that what makes us special. I agree. It takes a bit to sit down and really think about what you do and what value you bring to clients. Absolutely. Like that's, yeah. that's really what it's all about. Like we're all good at what we do. I want to believe that. I mean, I'll use all with an asterisk. There's some people who maybe aren't, but those people aren't on this call. So it's fine. Um, but yeah, just identify what it is. Why are you good at what you do? Right. There's a lot of different reasons that we add value to people. And the reason that somebody might think I'm a good realtor is different from the reason somebody might think you're a good realtor. And those are the key nuances that we need to push in the way that we're outwardly, outwardly building our brand story. Yeah. And it's hard to recognize that for yourself. Like, you know, the self-reflection piece, take giving yourself the time to go through these exercises is important, but also feedback from other people could be helpful. Like your spouse, your, your kids, um, maybe colleagues that you've worked with, maybe you had a really good deal, um, with another agent that you worked on with and, you know, asking them for their, their perspective, that might give you some insight. Again, it goes back as, as Richard said before, like that market research piece. Um, sometimes you might not recognize what it is that truly makes you special. I hope you do. Um, but sometimes it might take a little bit um, and people kind of recognizing that for your, for you can be, can be really helpful. Absolutely. And just remember again, everything we've talked about and will continue to talk about is connected. The idea of setting these plans in motion is that you now have a complete ecosystem of your business that's simple to follow because it's all consistent. So when you set your focus, which ties to your tactics, which ties to your budget, which ties to your content, 
all of it is going to speak the same language so that when you've got decisions to make and you're planning and you're doing different things with your business, it's not always feeling like you're starting from square one and what do I do now? You've built that framework for yourself and the brand is a big part of that. The brand is kind of putting all of that stuff into words that the rest of the world can understand. And okay, people, yeah, so Richard, yes, your mother hen, you care about client chicks so damn much. You need to communicate that better. It's true. You know what? Like, that is what makes you special. Like, you care so much. There's a lot of us, you know, when, when you're the type of person who takes people's problems as if they're your own and, mm -hmm. they, and what they're feeling is what you're feeling and it makes you upset the moment that they get upset and the same way you celebrate their successes with them, the same way they celebrate, that's what people need mm -hmm. to know, right? And it's not corny to say that. It is what makes you special to the clients that you've had. Again, if people are, are going to communicate that to you and are able to help tell that story for you, it makes the message even more powerful. Um, mm -hmm. But that is like, even just writing that sentence there, you know, I care for them so damn much, right? Like, yeah. That's different from just saying I care about my clients. So reading that makes me believe it. I've never been your client, but it makes me believe that if I was your client. Yeah. But you know what? Even Rich, like from what I've seen of Richard on Facebook through the interactions he has with us and with other people, I know that. Like I believe that definitely um, that he does that. And it's such an important trait um, to have. Well, it's an important trait, but it could be at your detriment sometimes too, because I, I, you know, <laughs> we, we feel you on that because that's something that we, we often struggle with is trying to take the emotion out of it because you can really start going into the weeds on, on, on that sort of thing. But um, it, it, it's such an important quality to have. And I think that's why you're so successful, Richard, is because people see that they see the genuine approach that you have. And that's what pe get, keeps people coming back and re probably referring a lot of business to you. Um, <laughs> oh, shucks. Um, yeah. And Ali asked about the book. It, it's Dare to Lead. Um, Brene Brown has a few podcasts. If you guys are into what, listening to podcasts, she's got a Dare to Lead podcast, um, as well as Unlocking Us. Those are great ones. They're not specifically real estate related, but just in terms of overall self-development. I find that they're really, really great. All right. We're over time. It's 1207. Thanks for sticking with us, everyone. <laughs> um, as always, let us know if you guys have any questions, reach out to us anytime. We'll send out the recording and the PDF resources again for you. Um, hopefully later today, if not sometime this weekend. We're at, the, we're at the midway point now. But, That's right. like, but honestly, the hard stuff, if you've been following along, the hard stuff's behind us now. Now we just get into all the stuff you've probably been waiting for, which is putting meat on the bone, so to say, <laughs> unless you're a vegetarian, putting leaves on the it's tree. Broccoli on, oh yeah. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> I don't know where I was going with broccoli. All anyway, good. all right. Have a good weekend, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Level up, 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 level up,